for around 40, 45 minutes, and then there will be half an hour for questions and contributions, after which there will be a reception outside where you'll have ample opportunity to continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kenny, for such an an introduction. I'm really honored to be here. I'm honored to meet the wonderful scholars, the young and the old. And um, and again, I want also to thank Louise, to thank Tom, to thank everybody for working uh, to bring me here. It was really an illumination and control, not only through occupation of the territories, which it's important looking at walls, looking at checkpoints and other modes of separation, our state apparatus is <coughs> multiplied, transformed, circulated and deployed to further produce the prominence and exclusivity of the colonizer's regime. But also through the sensory and the embodied means. So utilizing various sensory phenomena, graffiti, sounds, vocabularies, narratives, even smells, the settler colony institutionalizes itself to cement its legitimacy and hegemony. So I want you to keep in mind how the settler colony is playing. When I, when I say even through smell, I mean it. Because for example, using skunk water on homes, schools, houses, the skunk water stays on clinics, stays in those places for such a long time. And the question, what, the, what is the performativity of such a bad smell? What is the theatricality of such an act of throwing skunk water? And I do want to look at such things. I claim that there is a plurality of spheres that are not governed by a single organizing principle, but are rather operated through various tightly entangled colonial logic. Now, those spheres are legitimized, <coughs> are institutionalized, are ruled, are also mobilized by fluid settler colonial identities. And it could be the religious identity, it could be the cultural identity, the musical, the historical, the political. And they're all working in tandem to optimize and to ratify the absolute domination of the official regime. Maybe I should explain what do I mean when I talk about settler colony. Because when I see, when I talk about Israel as a settler colonial state, I mean three main issues. Number one, <coughs> settler colonialism means that it's a structure, not an event. It's not one event here and one event there, but rather a structure that is operating together to control, to mark the body, and to inscribe power. Second, the settler is there to stay. So the eviction of the native is always at work. So this tendency to indigenize the settler and to evict the native. And number three, as Patrick Wolf would say, it's built on a logic of elimination. So these are the three factors to me that explain the settler colonial condition in Israel. As part of its colonial territorial project, Israel began, it began its occupation uh, of East Jerusalem in 1967. Since then, as in other areas in historic Palestine, the Israeli state had enacted a regime of policies intended to promote the Judaization of the land and to eradicate any Palestinian presence. And Professor Masalha is here to tell us more. It's an Israeli state policy objective to achieve a demographic balance, and especially when I'm talking about uh, occupied East Jerusalem, the issue of having 28% Palestinian and 72% um, uh, Israeli Jews is the plan, according to Nadar Shargai, according to different documentation that were published by Israel. To this end, Israeli authorities maintain total control of the residency status in occupied East Jerusalem. And legally, they have the right to revoke the residency of Palestinians. And I will be talking more about it. One methodological note before I start with, with, um, with the 
<laughs> one methodological note is that this study and this um, um, the working on the occupation <coughs> of the senses was not conceptualized right from the beginning as a multi-sensory analysis um, project, but rather was developed through my own lived experience as a Palestinian residing and living in uh, occupied East Jerusalem, mainly in the old city of uh, Jerusalem. So the methodology employed was based on participant observation, on me walking, talking with people in the street, and living the occupation of the census, and checking it with people. So the concept came and the analysis came you know, by shopping, by talking, by 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 talking to in the market. So, this feeling, those moments of disruption, of uh, of livelihood, was so major, and this is what brought me to study um, the issue. Let me start by showing you one um, one demonstration in the area of Sheikh Jarrah. Sheikh Jarrah is a neighborhood in in East Jerusalem, and there were lots of eviction at that time, eviction of Palestinian homes, and you know, throwing the Palestinians out of their homes and bringing uh, Israeli settlers. And of course, it was done legally. Anyway, you know, as I say in my writing, colonialism was done legally. So this is the... theatricality of the invasion of the census. You can see it through the flags, you can see it through the slogans, you can see it through the music, you hear it, you smell it, you see it. The violence of the sovereign power, as I wish to argue and analyze, attacks the census of the otherized subject and moves through urban spaces and everyday acts. Such performances of power allow the hegemonic group to maintain its exclusive privilege of violence, cruelty, humiliation, <coughs> and the outlawing of the other who is deemed nobody. Leading into my analysis of the occupation of the census, I will begin by considering aesthetics and symbolic violence against Palestinians with a focus on the visual display of power, such as state-sponsored Jerusalem Light Festival, I will move from there into looking at what is called price tag, tag mechir, and the graffiti used by uh, some Jewish group. And then I'll move into looking at the parades and marches through the colonized spaces where the visual intersects with the stimuli to produce a more complete colonial regime of control over Palestinian sensory experiences. From there, I will deal with the biopolitical and necropolitical manifestation of the occupation of the census. I will discuss the demographic and birth in the colonial context, arguing that this occupation, the dynamics of the occupation, extends to the experience of pregnant women and giving birth mothers, penetrating their senses and wounds. And I will end up with stories of children that were shot in their eyes and will talk about the meaning. My theorization <coughs> addressed the way in which the use of violent imaginary and sensory stimuli by colonial governments can itself constitute a state crime. 
Whereas traditional criminological approaches define violence in legal and physical terms, neglecting to consider aesthetics and sensory forms of oppression, I consider how actions which are not defined under the formal law as crimes and do not necessarily involve direct physical violence, yeah, nevertheless form part of the settler colonial criminal apparatus. If you look at the spatial and sensory colonization, through what I term the occupation of the senses, colonized spaces is permeated with colonial sensory stimulus. The diffusion of state imaginary into public space can serve to articulate colonial power. By displaying the flags, as we have seen, constructing desert output and holding ceremonial army parades, the British mandate authority made itself known to its citizen in colonial Jordan. In apartheid South Africa, public state markers such as monument and street names were used to form and display an exclusionary settler ethnic identity. Dictatorial and fascist states such as Italy under Mussolini saturated the public area with imaginary valorizing their respective regime. Thus, colonial and authoritarian regimes alike publicly project state aesthetics to display their power. In the Israeli case, it is well established that state imaginary represents the Jewish population and excludes the Palestinian citizens. Shaping Jewish-Israeli national memory and reinforcing a hegemonic, a hegemonic Zionist ideology. Unlike in some other settler colonial contexts, such as colonial Algiers, <coughs> in which the French state held Bastille Day ceremonies, Israeli state cultural events are not intended to assimilate the colonized Palestinian, but rather to express visual control over the space. Right-wing Israeli rallies, for instance, uh, for instance, serve as venues for the projection of colonial symbols into the colonized space of occupied East Jerusalem. In their visual content, they are reminiscent of marches held in the settler colonial context of Northern Ireland, which are used by loyalist organization as a means of displaying flags and banners and defending hegemonic state symbols in response to so-called perceived threat, threats. Providing a potentially re relevant theoretical framework for considering Israeli aesthetic violence, the uneven distribution of the visual rights undergrids the relationship between the settler and the colonized. For as Hochberg has said, and I quote, how much one can see, what one can see, and in what way one can see or be seen are outcomes of socially constructed visual arrangements produced and sustained by power relations, complicating the accounts which posit a direct relationship between senses and power. I argue that seeing, hearing, smelling, and feeling can function and aid the settler colony in their dispossession, in their dispossession of the space, in their dispossession of time, in their dispossession of livelihood of the Palestinians. So let me show you part of the what we see here. This is the light festival. The Israeli often hosts allegedly benign cultural artistic and this is very close to my house, yeah. Musical uh, event in the city of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem Light Festival, for instance, is a state-sponsored annual event held in occupied East Jerusalem in which uh, illuminated display <coughs> and visual artworks are projected onto the building. This is uh, <coughs> the Damascus Gate. In the Old City, the festival official website describes the event as follows, and I quote, we invite you to walk along the illuminated trail and take part in this very special event that combines the enchanted atmosphere of the Old City with innovative and inspiring installations. You can wander the Old City's uh, alleys, walk among breathtaking, uh, breathtaking works of art from Israel and abroad, and see mesmerizing artistic shows and presentations and huge videos, projections, screens, 
on the old city's famous building and its ancient rampart. The Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs described the light festival similarly as, and I quote, magical, compelling, multi-sensory celebration of artistic events. Visitors will be interested um, to, to see the colors and the beauty of the old city. Such descriptions, I argue, situate the light festival as a cosmopolitan, artistic, and cultural spectacle, yeah? Absent of any political content, which is fascinating to a person like me who lived in the old city. As occupied East Jerusalem becomes transformed into a mystical and ancient atmospheric venue, the realities of Israeli colonization and demographic manipulation efforts are obs uh, obscured. The old city becomes like a museum exhibit rather than the living and breathing site of contestation yeah, between settler state and its native population. Moreover, as the state literally projects itself into colonized spaces, the way in which the light festivals serve to re serves to reinforce its power over the colonized territory are really hidden from the view during this light festival. So it's about culture. It's about the art that is really uh, embedded in the entire discussion of the light festival. <coughs> so in a statement made prior to a recent light festival, Barkat, who is the um, mayor of Jerusalem, emphasizes Jerusalem pluralistic nature, yeah? And I quote, Jerusalem is a massive mosaic of people and communities, views and sights, smells and tastes that can all be found in the old city. While deploying a multiculturalistic discourse, Barkat fails to mention the deep racialized power inequities that shaped life in the old city. Thus, the facade of cultural diversity and you know, when, when explaining and talking about the light festival, mask the ultimate and reinforces Israeli Jewish dominance, pointing to the views, sights, smells, and tastes. So portraying Jerusalem as a busting city being entered and exited by tourists, Barkat neglects its effective effect its effect on Palestinians living in the old city of Jerusalem. The question that is asked, well, what happened to the Palestinian who is living in the old city? Can he really, can she really walk around? What will happen? How much, how much police and soldiers are there? Just look at this. This, is a, this I can see it from the window of my house. And this is an old uh, Jewish uh, rabbi probably who tells the story of the Jewish history. So the walls also are telling a story. The walls are insisting Jerusalem is Judaized. And through the light festival, there is a clear message beyond the aesthetic and the occupation of the city. Well, this is not enough. I'm taking you now to, and these are the usual sites of the Palestinian spaces. It's about child arrest, it's about checking the IDs, it's about a heavily militarized area. But let me take you to price tag, tag mechir. A more blatant and exclusionary form of aesthetic violence can be found in the graffiti produced by the Israeli Jewish religious nationalist movement, tag mechir, price tag. Price tag is a movement that commits allegedly retaliatory acts of physical violence and crimes towards uh, Palestinians, as well as <coughs> producing graffitis with hateful racist messages on Palestinian private property and public sites. While often portrayed as a small group, and usually that is the discussion between me and others, that it's a small group, the movement is allied with the goal of the state and consistent with the Zionist history of settler colonial violence, and if you wish to read more about my argument, it, is, it was published in 2015 in the British Journal of Criminology. So Tag Mechir commits a wide range of violent acts against Palestinians. Their visual manifestation, <coughs> the graffiti, form part of the settler colonial aesthetic 
landscape and aesthetic plans. <coughs> the content of tag Mechir graffiti ranges widely, including justificatory violent act, retaliatory, retaliation against the Arabs, or there will be a war over Judea and Samaria, or the names of the settlements or individuals such as Kahana Chai, Jewish nationalist symbol David Shield and the fist of Kahana, anti-Christian and anti-Muslim messages, uh, <coughs> Jesus, son of Mary the whore, Muhammad is a pig, messages promoting the eviction of non-Jews, get out of here, text glorifying the Jewish people, for example, that was written beside my house, Jew smile, you are the son of God. And necropolitical uh, charge juxtaposition between Jewish life and Palestinian <coughs> death. The people of Israel live death to the Arabs. So these messages that you can see, for example, here on the car, it's written, price tag, Muhammad is a pig. This is beside the Greek Orthodox uh, Church, Greeks out. This is on another mosque. Of course, Muhammad <coughs> is uh, dead. Jesus is uh, son of Maria. The whore, these messages are written in, this is the burning of one of the mosques, or yeah, this is the mosque, that's not the church that was burned. So these messages written in Palestinian private and public spaces covers uh, to produce a violent aesthetic atmosphere for the colonized and legitimate crimes against them. Whereas the colonial nature of Jerusalem light festival is light, yeah, and shrouded, the actions and graffiti of Tag Mechir can hardly be more overt. The graffiti constitutes a more extreme, um, a more extreme uh, and, uh, and genocidal form of aesthetic violence, reflecting and foreshadowing actual acts of brutality. And here I just put for you the figure that uh, from OCHA, which is the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, about the desecration of mosques and churches by the Israeli settlers during from 2006 to 2014, and the burning of one of the things that we have we have noticed <coughs> clearly is the burning of olive trees and the burning of trees, and. Uh, um, um, this is the uprooting of trees. Again, you can see from 2009 a major, uh, so it's, the, it's an, on an increase. And of course, the Israeli settlers uh, are also resulting in, uh, in casualties or property damage among Palestinians. And again, these are the cases that were, um, were documented by, uh, uh, by OCHA. Listen to Nahed. Nahed is 42 years old from the old city. At the entrance to our house, they, Tag Mechir, sprayed the Star of Davis and the phrase, Tista Kumikam, get out of here. All in black, they invaded the neighborhood at night, scared the kids and sprayed Mavet Larabim, the big <coughs> Arabs, on the walls. And when we called the police and asked for help, they don't even come to check on the area, let alone listen to what we have to say. They treat us like animals, like we're not human, like we don't have families that need to feel safe when sleeping, or children that need to know that at least the walls of their homes are secure. I will move now to the Zionist marches and parades in the Palestinian space. <coughs> so visual imaginary is not the only sensory means through which the state enacts control over occupied East Jerusalem. As demonstrated by Israeli Jewish nationalist parades and marches that take place in the city. Sight is but one of the many senses impacted by, uh, impacted by them. The Israeli state supports a number of public parades and festivals which both enforce the separation between the colonizer and the colonized and enable the colonizer to enter and dominate colonized spaces. As Ranciers explains, the distribution of the sensible reveals who can have a share in what is common to the community based on what they do and on the time and space in which this activity is performed. Ranciers notes that, and I quote, 
the essential work of politics is <coughs> the configuration of its own space, i.e., the delineation of the terms of political discourse, who can participate and who is excluded, which forms of speech and expression are understood as legitimate and which are dismissed. While Ranciers uh, is primarily referring here to discursive space such as processes are often also map onto physical territory, such that territorial relations of power mirror the way in which they serve as a mode of policing, and this is how I see it, which reminds the Palestinian of their status outside the process of decision making and outside the space of Jerusalem, of their homes while at home. Such a specialized enactment of power occurs annually. And this is the Jerusalem parade during the Jerusalem they parade, it's a national holiday, and it's a catastrophe for people living like me in the old city. The occupation of, the, and the, you know, they <coughs> celebrate the occupation of Eastern Jerusalem in, uh, in, in 67. Each year, it's marked by an Israeli Jewish parade through the old city, penetrating Palestinian spaces with flags, with nationalist symbols, Palestinians are obliged to close their stores and remain confined, or more precisely, imprisoned in their homes. The parade serves to glorify the Jewish people with <coughs> chants and slogans as David, the King of Israel, the nation of Israel is alive, and uh, which appeal to the young and the old to enjoy the land as a sacralized settler colonial entity. So it is, you know, the acts are really sacralized and they're reusing lots of uh, religious but nationalist and they're all very strong. In 2015 parade, over 30,000 young religious and nationalist Israeli Jews rampaged through the old city, chanting that the Arab Muhammad is dead and racist <coughs> toward them, restructuring the sensory experience of uh, the of the Palestinians. <coughs> 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 separation blockage, you see that the, how the police and how the military are really so-called maintaining safety, yeah? Uh, performing a clear racialized aesthetics of biopolitical power. Clear racialized aesthetics of biopolitical power. This racial logic that is performed theatrically in so many ways inside the old city of Jerusalem can be seen in other colonial contexts. <coughs> seen it in South Africa, and noting that the rights of the black people to live in the city of Johannesburg were constantly threatened during apartheid. 
uh, during apartheid. Sarah Nottel and Achille Mambi argue that race, particularly in the colonial society, is used in urban settings as weapons in the production of barriers and asymmetrical <coughs> privileges. But over here, it's this racialized logic that is inscribed not only over the space, but rather over the lives and over the living. Just think about a child walking and watching what I have showed you. Through the performativity and the theatrical characteristic of the parade in the old city of Jerusalem, this division is made more clear. While these marches take place, settler temporality confiscates the streets, transforming areas of occupied East Jerusalem into a neo territories via possession that are meant to intimidate and incite fear, but it's also there to tell the Palestinian we are here to control the space. <coughs> this space belongs to us. The mass dispossession and commodification of Palestinian spaces and their conversions into Jewish theological and national sites is characterized by an access of Israeli flags and other symbols. These are to claim power, to construct historical legitimacy, and to impose excessive sensory stimulus over Palestinian spaces. But that is not the end. Let me read the board. The days before my delivery were very tough here in the old city. The settlers kept on attacking our, st our streets. Uh, fighting with our family member and the Israeli police were throwing tear gas bombs at us and arresting Palestinians all the time. I spent the five days before my delivery suffocated by tear gas, coughing all the time with red eyes, unable to sleep from fear and the health of my newborn would be affected. When my contraction started, it was Yom Kippur and the settlers around us did not allow us to even walk in the streets. My husband needed to bring a taxi clo as close as possible to our house, and that took more than three hours, as the soldiers refused to allow the taxi to come in. I was waiting alone, forever, on the corner of the street, in pain. My water broke, my pain exacerbated, my breathing stopped. Fear and silence filled the area. I ended up fainting in the street from pain, horror, and loss. I woke up in the hospital. I'm still in pain, and my baby is suffering from breathing problems. The colonial discourse of demographic threats manifests not only in birth statistics, which I will be showing you, but also in the lived experiences of pregnant women. And here I borrow Salam boys, who elaborate on how the occupation of the census invaded space, time, and her time, and the time of the baby in the womb. <coughs> Salam's narrative of birth pain, suffocation, and hope starkly displays the regime of control over the very intimate senses in the womb, in time of birth. Terror, a mechanism used to implement this regime of control, is the mediator par excellence of colonial hegemony imposed over Palestinian birthing bodies through the denial of accessibility. In Salam's testimonial, as with other Palestinian women I have interviewed, the body encompasses physical space and time, <coughs> becoming deeply implicated in her experience. Ironically, time comes to be conceptualized in her words as a place, a space of timelessness, an, an eternity of waiting and wishing for the multiple assaults on her daily life to be over. Thus, for the colonized, as Fanon explained, to live means to keep on existing. Every day is a victory. And of course, as I have explained, <coughs> the main aim of the Israelis in looking at and controlling and affecting this element of biopolitics is also not issuing birth certificates. So Israel, and just read what is written in the, in the newspaper, Israel to stop issuing birth certificates to children of foreigners. And who are the foreigners? 
According to the Israeli Council for the Child, 78% of the 152,000 children in Israel, and they include East Jerusalem and Israel, who do not have birth certificates are from East Jerusalem. So children are born, but that doesn't mean that they are giving them birth certificates. So think, think about children being born not having birth certificates. This is uh, birth statistics. Again, it's based on my research on the politics of birth in Jerusalem. Just look at two details. Live birth according to the Israeli Central Statistic Bureau and, the, and live birth according to the Palestinians and the total population. You would notice that the Palestinians, that the Israelis would say that in 2010 there were 8,299 uh, live births, and the Palestinians would say 3,042. So there are 5,000 babies missing, you notice? And then the total population, the Israelis would like to maintain the Judaization and demographic control, 22% Palestinian, 78. So they mentioned that in occupied East Jerusalem, there are 283,000 and some, while the Palestinian, the discrepancy is almost 100,000. So this is so telling about the regime of control in occupied East Jerusalem. I'm moving to the main link of side. The maintenance of control over Palestinian side is a structuring principle <coughs> of settler colonial <coughs> rule in occupied East Jerusalem. Israeli aesthetics, performances of power, graffiti, the parade, the festivals, are at some level dependent on the Palestinian side. So they need the Palestinian to see their power and the inscription of their ability to stay their control they need the side of the Palestinians, which is called upon the colonizer to confirm the Jewishness of the space. If and when the side of the Palestinians <coughs> challenges such commandment, the settler colonial regime dictates their side should be maimed. I analyze <coughs> this violence, this violent disciplinary performance of the settler colonial criminality by considering the case of Muhammad, who was only five years old when he was shot in the eyes by the Israeli soldiers. I met Muhammad at Dr. Nadal, my dentist in, uh, in Aysawi. One of the nice things about Palestinians is that they collect data for me. So the doctor knew that I am interviewing children that were shot in their eyes. So I arrived to the clinic and said, Dr. I'm here, I have uh, Muhammad is here. So I was asking and talking to Muhammad, and Muhammad was telling me what happened. And he said the following, I was very hungry. I ran home. He came from school. He was in the school bus, so he was very hungry. But it seems I frightened the soldiers because I was rushing, and they shot me in the eye. And now I have metal under the skin of my cheek. I can barely see, and I have bad, bad headaches. I can't see well. <coughs> and so when I asked him, so what will happen next, <coughs> Muhammad? His answer was, Khalas, I don't want to be hungry again. And shooting in the eyes, I have interviewed 13 kids, this is Zakaria, and is is one of the uh, violent aesthetic uh, that I am tracking. And, um, and to me, the attack on, their, on the side of kids represents really the culmination of a trajectory of domination, taking aesthetic control to a more forceful level in the performance of power, of the Zionist power. The shooting is then a manifestation of, ter of terror and the involuntary imposition of disability onto the colonial subject. And you know what? Usually the discussion is that, what do you want? We did not kill him. We only maimed him. So the modern state is keeping, preserving its right 
to maim, as a spear choir would say, instead of killing. So they have, they do have the force, the power to kill, but they're maiming. Yeah. Here, disability is not a medical biological condition, but rather one that is politically induced. The maiming of children who are unable to defend themselves is intrinsic to the function of the colonial war machine. The blinding of Palestinian children clearly demonstrates what Jasper Poir refers as the biopolitics of the right to maim. Similarly, Elaine Scarry maps the manner in which militarized mutilation works to unmake human beings precisely by destroying their capacity. Thus, the settler colonial rationale to viciously discipline the native aims not only to control the movements and the acts of the colonized, but also to tame the psychic and police the senses. I'll end with necrophenology, a concept that I'm using lately. and. Um, on extreme embodied violence. To illustrate the redistribution of the sensible, a vicious disciplinary attack took place in 2015 when a group of religious nationalist Israeli, the, the group of Tag Mekhir, burned the home of an entire Palestinian family in occupied uh, West Bank in Duma killing an 18-month-old baby, his parents, and severely injuring his four-year-old brother. Such extreme forms of embodied violence directed toward the family in their home may be, views, may be viewed as the logical culmination of the parades that we have seen, which promote the expulsion of Palestinians from the police. Yeah? In addition to invading the senses and the public and private sphere, violent state-approved marches also reproduce the structures of Jewish supremacy which give legitimacy to such cruelty. Through the distribution of the sensible as from he established its power in different ways. And here I'm bringing the voice of Abu Zahim Hatam Manasra's father who told me, they brought him, who told me after, after a war with the Israeli court and legal system begging to release the bodies of the Palestinians. They, uh, they ended up returning Hassan Manasra with lots of conditions. And this is the father. They brought him frozen, I negotiated with, I agreed to all their conditions, but asked them not to bring him frozen. I clearly explained to them when I was in room number four that I do not want him frozen. I want his mother to hug and kiss him. I want his sister and brothers to pay their final respect to him. And he was so cold, frozen, like a cold rock. What happened in this case is that the father was asked to identify the body of his son. And when he saw the body and he saw the condition, actually it was worse than frozen. The, the condition of the body was, was very bad. The father decided not to take the body and not to bury him, although in Islam, Ikram uh, al definitely so the respect of the dead is to bury them fast. But he decided to return the body and to tell them this is not my son and to ask the family, the, the 20 people that were there, they only allowed uh, a small number of people to go back home. And it was one of the very tough moments for me as, as, a, as a member of the community and as a scholar to hear what happened and to understand and to support the family in, in this condition. This is his mother. I was praying for his release from the Israeli refrigerators. I wanted him out, <coughs> I wanted him free. I hated his cold incarceration in their prison, even as a dead body. That's what, how she ended it. To bury your own child is the hardest thing ever. And all I want and pray for is to bury my child. Let me conclude. My talk uncovers how the occupation of the senses 
in its use of aesthetic violence, invades the spaces, invades the spaces, homes, streets, and bodies of the colonized to generate forms of racial exclusivity. I argue that the marking of power by maiming children's sides, withholding dead bodies, produce and reproduces injustices by dispossessing the colonized not only from the space, but also from the ability to feel what goes on from their senses, even in death. The colonial practice of marking, of stripping, and maiming the body <coughs> through various modes of sensory violence demonstrates that the colonized city is a space of exterminability, a necropolitical space that exhibits the settler colonial economy of death. I claim that there is a plurality of spheres that are governed not by a single organizing principle, but rather operate through various tightly entangled colonial logic. These spheres are legitimized, institutionalized, ruled, and mobilized by fluid settler colonial identities, working in tandem to control the area. The occupation of the senses, as I raise it, raises the extent to which the realm of aesthetic and sensory is a domain of contestation between two separate spatial epistemic domains and order, that of the colonized and the colonizer. The aesthetic is, is to show the limits, that there is no limit of state power and there is no limit of their ability to dispossess. In my examination, I examined the extent to which the aesthetic worked to promote territorial, extraterritorial, and territorial claims. Because as you have seen, it should not be on the territory. But it's there. It's in the womb of the, of the mother. It's in, over the dead body of Hassan Manasra. And, and, and there are those secret rules of marking bodies with pain marking bodies with torture, and the creation of a kind of a jail body, a nation of jail bodies not found, but made. The occupation of the senses eliminates the sensual, the visible, and invisible, a gradual over, um, evolution from the native senses and their political, geopolitical spaces to the settler made and imposed space. It is the displacement of the former by the later, working through the infiltration of the mere senses of the native at various moments of cruelty and violence. The new aesthetic narrative displaces the existing one by threatening, by destabilizing, or simply making it ambiguous, a strategy I wish to claim of intellectual indoctrination of everybody that is walking there to help naturalize this jail body. So by the occupation of the senses, I meant really to show you how the Israeli system works biopolitically on the bodies, geopolitically on the, on the space, and necropolitically in the dead body.